So we're ready to talk about a more interesting topic of Linux security and of computer security in general. And the topic that we're going to cover here is Linux firewalls. And firewalls have often been referred to as Layer 3 security because for many, many years, firewalls only were able to understand information as it passed over the network layer or Layer 3. Now, as time and technology have moved forward, firewalls have become more flexible and more intelligent, ultimately earning the names such as Layer 7 firewall or various application level firewalls. So the term firewall is not necessarily as accurate today as it has always been because there are varying levels of firewalls themselves. So we're going to take a brief look at an introduction to the concepts of firewalls and how they might apply to our security practices in a Linux environment and we'll also take a look at two different aspects of Linux as associated to firewalls. And the first thing we're going to look at is IP tables which is the de facto standard for securing Linux at the firewall level. So it pretty much comes bundled with everything across the board and is pretty easy to configure and offers a lot of flexibility. And finally we're going to talk about dedicated Linux firewalls. These are distributions that are only around for the purpose of protecting a network. So we're going to cover two different very contrasting sides of Linux firewalls. So the basic idea of a firewall is that it was originally designed to protect the perimeter of networks. So we would place firewalls at the entry and exit points of our network to protect our network from malicious data coming in or in some cases going out. Now firewalls have evolved and become application level firewalls and host based firewalls and all these different flavors. One thing to keep in mind is that firewalls are never a complete security solution although they are probably one of the top five most important components when considering firewalls in the defense in depth strategy. So firewalls are basically traffic cops. They are only going to allow traffic that meets specific requirements to pass through or to enter the operating system at the kernel level. So firewalls are basically just filters or strainers that weed out the bad packets and allow the good packets. Now we can actually filter information based on the port or the service in which it's destined to, the protocol that it's using, whether it's TCP or UDP, as well as the source or destination address, whether that be MAC or IP, and in addition, in stateful inspection firewalls, we can actually base our information based on the established connection, whether it is or is not established, and at what point in the communication process is it at that time. So more intelligent application firewalls can actually filter based on the contents of the packet. In other words, if this HTTP packet is destined for a web server and contains this line of information, we want to block that and allow everything else. So that allows us to protect ourselves from things such as Unicode attacks or directory traversal. Linux actually comes with a lot of different flavors of firewalls and built-in security capabilities. So we can actually configure some of the Linux features to act as a host protection or host base firewall to protect that individual system or we can actually build the Linux system as a dedicated enterprise level firewall. So we give it multiple interfaces and we would configure the traffic flow and try to have control over what enters and exits the network. Now another great feature of utilizing Linux as a router or firewall is that Linux offers a lot of great backwards compatibility support for older hardware. So we can take that old Commodore system that we have laying around in the closet and install a really trimmed down version of the Linux kernel that only routes and protects our network. Now a couple of examples of built-in firewalls includes the older IP chains and the newer IP tables. Now IP tables is kind of the updated better version of IP chains. It actually added some additional chains in and some new features and capabilities and it also simplified the configuration of the IP firewall series. 
Now in addition to built-in firewalls, there are also dedicated distributions that are built specifically to be a firewall. And some of the more popular ones include things such as IPCOP, and smooth wall. An IP cop is actually a newer, somewhat improved, depending on who you ask, version of smooth wall. But it's actually built on the original code of the smooth wall distribution. So this should give you a pretty good idea of where firewalls play in the grand scheme of security as it relates to Linux. So we're going to kick things off talking about IP tables. And IP tables, as we mentioned before, is a replacement for the older IP chains firewall, which comes usually by default in the Linux operating system. IP tables has been around since the release of the 2.4 version of the Linux kernel. So it's been around for quite some time, and any previous distributions need to be upgraded to the most recent kernel or replaced altogether to enable the support for the newer IP tables configuration utility. So the idea here is we're going to set up the configuration of the built-in firewall for host-based protection. Now we can obviously configure this to do pretty much anything. IP tables can be used for routing, forwarding, filtering, just about anything you want. But in our example, and what we're going to talk about here is just focusing on host-based protection. Now IP tables, unlike some of its previous types of firewall versions, actually allows for stateful packet filtering, meaning we can monitor the state of the communication process and make decisions based on that. So that's definitely a useful feature because in the past people were able to bypass firewall rules by skipping the beginning parts of the TCP communication process. So we obviously have a lot of filtering options and most commonly we're going to filter based on protocol and port. But we can also have the capabilities to filter based on the source IP address or network and even the connection state, which is kind of what defines IP tables as a stateful inspection firewall. We can also filter based on MAC addresses, which this is obviously used a little bit less, but in some DMZ environments where you have a controlled set of MACs, it might be a little bit easier or make more sense to use this feature. We can also monitor for malformed packets based on the flags that have been set. So we know that a particular machine will never be seeing a Christmas tree packet, which is where pretty much everything is turned on. So we can actually set out filters to protect against those type attacks. So true to its name, the packets are going to enter into the host network adapter and be processed through one of three different tables. The first table we're going to talk about is the mangle table, which is basically a quality of service management table and is going to monitor and handle various types of traffic appropriately. Now without getting into a lot of detail, Mangle is not often used because there are better quality of service software packages out there. The filter table or the most common table that's going to be used for host-based firewalls actually has three different chains that can be broken down to process the traffic. The third and final table is the NAT table, or the Network Address Translation table. This is commonly used for routing or protecting the perimeter of the network from external public IP ranges. So we'll set up the NAT table if this is a perimeter firewall with multiple interfaces. So this basically allows us to change the source and destination ports and the source IP addresses to allow for protection of the internal network as well as masking of that internal network. There are two chains inside the NAT table. The pre-routing, which is going to modify and monitor the destination address, and the post-routing, which is going to handle all source address modifications. So moving into the actual filter table, we have these three chains. And a chain is basically a direction, if you will, that contains multiple rules. So inside the filter table we have three chains that each contain a set of rules. So the input chain is going to handle rules for packets that are inbound to the host. 
For example, if someone sends a ping request from host B to host A, and host A has an input filter set to deny ICMP requests or ping requests, then that packet will be handled appropriately for that rule because it is inbound. So it will check the input chain. The forward chain is for packets that are outbound or destined for another network but have been received as an input as well and is usually reserved for things such as routing or forwarding which will require multiple interfaces and usually for that box to be a router or a NAT system or even a firewall. So forwarding for host based IP tables configurations will be disabled or simply set to drop all. That way forwarding will never take place. Now another interesting chain in the IP tables filter table is the output chain. And the output chain is basically broken down into anything that is leaving the local host. So if I send an HTTP request to a remote web server, then it's going to be parsed into and filtered by the output chain and ran through any rules that exist there. So once the IP tables process has determined which chain is going to be used, the traffic is then passed down into the rule set associated with that chain. An outbound chain that has a default deny for everything. I would never be able to send traffic outside the host. On the other hand, if I allow HTTP traffic but deny everything else, then I can browse the web all day long, but I can't use SSL and I can't use FTP or any other protocol that is not HTTP. So the rules are checked in the order in which they have been entered. So from top to bottom, if you're actually listing out the chain rules. and it's going to check for all the rules all the way to the bottom. Once it reaches one that is a match, then it's going to process that based on the action that has been set for that rule. If no matches are found, then it's going to drop back to the default chain rule, which is basically set up through a policy. So, assuming that our rule for HTTP outbound actually matches one of my outbound filters. Depending on how I have it set up, I can actually choose to accept that traffic, meaning that it will be processed and exits to the destination, or I can reject that packet, which is basically going to throw back an error message and say, this is not allowed, it's been rejected. Or I can drop the packet altogether, meaning that any system that's been affected by this rule will not be notified, it just simply won't work. We can also choose to log the packet, which is basically going to send it to the default configuration for system logging, which is by default the syslog daemon. We can also choose to process that through destination NAT handling or source NAT handling. So we configure our rules for forwarding, for example, to drop into those NAT processes so that we can handle the internal and external IP ranges appropriately. Now in order to do all of these wonderful things that we're talking about, we will configure IP tables in a couple of different ways. The first of which is through the manual typing of the IP tables command, which is definitely a possibility but would become very cumbersome if you have a large network that is complex and ever changing. So we'd have to manually go in and type IP tables dash a etc over and over and over again until we had the rule set the way we wanted it. Or we can actually go in and if we have webmin installed and configured on the system we can access the web based management interface. Now in high security environments this is probably not an option as well. So we're going to move into and actually go into a demonstration of the more recommended way to configure IP tables in a secure environment for hosts. So at this point, we're going to move into the demonstration of our IP tables configuration. Now, one of the things that you'll notice here is I have a shell script sitting on the desktop of my system. And one of the reasons that I have this is because it is the easiest and most logical way to configure the IP tables firewall settings. Now, this is actually a script that I stole off the internet somewhere years ago and I've kind of modified it along the way and kept different versions to suit my needs as I work with clients and configure systems. So this particular version of the script 
is a very basic host-based protection system. So we're going to walk through and take a look at the script, and everything that you see that's in black or dark color is what will actually be run at the command line. So you can imagine, for example, if I was going to configure this manually, I would have to type every single one of these commands in order to make this very simple configuration happen. So instead of doing that, we create a simple shell script and we start off and we jump into and basically flush out all the settings and remove any chain contents and these two commands basically serve to all but wipe out any settings except for policies associated with IP tables now we move into the basic settings so we're going to first configure here's what we don't want well first of all we want to drop everything that comes into forwarding and we can see that we're using a couple of different commands and if we go look at the help file associated with IP tables it'll give us a good idea of what dash a for a pen for example might mean so as you can see the simple commands are a pen to the chain delete the chain and set it as a policy so we're setting up the policies for our forwarding table to drop everything and for our input table to drop everything that hasn't been defined and these again are kinda like defaults if it doesn't match my explicit rule set then we're gonna deny or we're gonna apply that policy so the next one is a line that should always be added into any script for IP tables which is essentially always allow local host to communicate with local host only in extreme circumstances will you not want this line to be present another very important almost staple line here is to accept all established and related sessions so we're actually checking the session state and validating that it is either established already or is related to an already established connection so this allows us to not kill any legitimate traffic or any legitimate communication processes now these next four lines are actually optional and notice we're actually appending to the input and by default append is going to say go ahead and drop it up so that it's processed so we're gonna actually go through and specify the protocol that we're gonna use which is ICMP and we're gonna look for ICMP type destination unreachable time exceeded and echo both request and reply now you can remove these and everything will work fine on your system but by removing these you remove the ability to troubleshoot your network connectivity by using ICMP so you should definitely consult your settings and your default configuration requirements for your network before enabling these or disabling them now the next little set is the services and ports that are going to be enabled on the system now as you can see here I've commented out HTTP and HTTPS because this is a client workstation and is not running any web services so we already set our input policy to drop so by not explicitly specifying anything we can simply say the only thing that's going to be allowed inbound is going to be ICMP established connections local host based communication and in this scenario we're adding an SSH so we're gonna append that to the rule set and say go ahead and allow secure shell inbound now obviously if we didn't want to use that we could simply comment that out and we're in good shape But we're gonna leave that enabled and the last couple of things that we have here are setting up logging which is going to be go ahead and log any information and we're going to append that to apply to everything in the list we're also going to go ahead and set up some default post process denies which is drop everything that hasn't already been accepted and finally accept everything associated with output and drop everything associated with forward so the easy thing to do here we're comfortable with our settings and everything that we've configured and we're simply going to copy this information over we're going to move it over into root bin and call it firewall.sh
So we'll simply rename that to firewall.sh. You don't necessarily have to do that, but for simplicity purposes, I definitely prefer to do so. And then we'll simply run root bin So we're going to go ahead and execute this, and before we do that, we're going to go ahead and validate that it has the associated permissions. So now we can see that the IP tables configuration has been successfully run and in order to validate that we can crank up a shell and run the IP tables command with list specified and port that into a text file. And that will allow us to actually go look at the configuration and verify that it meets our needs. And as you can see here the input chain is going to accept all for localhost all with a related and established state, ICMP that we specified, SSH as we wanted to, and it's going to log anything that matches something other than these, and finally drop everything else. And we can see our forward table is going to drop, and our output table is going to accept, which is exactly how we intended to configure it. So as you can see, configuring IP tables is relatively simple, but by setting it up in a shell script, you can verify that your settings are going to be applied as intended in the order in which you wish them to be applied, and it allows you to see it a little bit easier than manually typing it in or going through any other processes. So in addition to having the ability to protect a local host and even some pieces of the network and applications with those firewalls, we can also protect the entire network. So dedicated Linux firewalls are basically specific Linux appliances that serve as firewalls for the entire enterprise. Usually these individual distributions are specially configured so that only the absolute minimum services are running. And these services usually include features such as NAT, VPN, firewall, usually you'll see a squid implementation in there for proxy services and things of that nature. You can actually find these to be embedded into the motherboard or actually installed to the disk locally. The two more popular dedicated firewall distributions are Smoothwall and IPCOP. Now personally, I like IPCOP, and I know Bobby Rogers is a big fan of Smoothwall. So we kind of differ in opinions there. I like IPCOP because it's a little bit easier to configure. Small distributions are definitely a huge benefit in this area of the market. So we want these distributions to be very tiny so that they can run on a very lean processing schedule and not use up very many resources. Another huge piece of these is that most of them have a pretty much standard set of configuration options which allows them to be very easily installed. Most of the time these dedicated Linux firewalls can utilize lower end equipment so we can actually recycle older stuff that we wouldn't normally use anymore. So both of these systems actually utilize a web interface after they've been installed through the console. They can both provide dedicated solutions for firewall, routing, VPN services, network address translation, and even proxy services. They also provide the ability to be updated over the web. So it'll go out and connect, and then you choose what updates to download and apply. Now there are a lot of other solutions out there, but most of them don't have the user and developer support that IPCOP and Smoothwall do. So we're going to look at a quick demonstration of my own personal implementation of IPCOP. 
So you can see the default screen here and notice we're using SSL to connect through and this particular system has been up for 21 days and we can see the actual IP address and the host name is hidden so that you can't find out any much information through randomly connecting to an interface such as this. Now if we want to look at anything we have to log in. So if we want to go look at the intrusion detection logs We log into the system and we can go look through those. Now this is actually implemented via Snort and breaks it down by time, date, source, destination, etc. We can also look at proxy logs, firewall logs, and even system logs. We can also go through and configure the firewall to allow port forwarding. And in this example you can see that I am allowing inbound for remote desktop protocol to a server inside the network with the IP address of 10.10.128.4. So I can set up these rules to allow specific services but everything is blocked by default. So we can configure and look at the system status. We can see that we're running cron, DHCP, IDS, NTP has been stopped, SSH is not allowed, and VPN is not currently configured. So we can look at memory utilization. As you can see, we can go on and on, but there are definitely quite a few huge benefits to utilizing these types of systems. Now, one of the wonderful features here that's not included in a lot of IPCOPS competitors is that I can actually go out and check for updates. So I go out to the IPCOPS server, find out if there are any updates, and as you can see, there aren't any. Right now, 1.4.10 is the current version. Now, in addition to that, I can actually set up the Snort Rules update to utilize the OINK script that will go out, utilize my OINK code, and download new rule sets. And as you can see, I keep them pretty well up to date. So using a dedicated Linux firewall solution is definitely a great way to go based on the ability to recycle hardware, the cost involved, and the ease of setup.